The very first programming languages that we created were simply the machine languages of the machines that were executing them. These languages look like modern assembly languages, but they don't support any ability to really group sequences of operations together. If you've ever programmed an assembly, you'll realize how crude and unstructured it is. It's so hard to be able to express our thoughts because it lacks the facilities for what is called procedural abstraction. Now, procedural abstraction is the name for the process by which we break our code into small and logically coherent units. Typically, when you design a program, the first thing you think about is the different functions you're going to need. And all programming languages that anyone uses today support facilities for procedural abstraction. These are typically called either procedures or functions or in object-oriented languages, they would be method. So here's a question. Think about, would it be possible to program in a language that didn't have any notion of procedures or functions at all? Do procedures and functions, do they actually add core expressive value to the language? Well, it turns out, perhaps surprisingly, that they do not. So Turing machines are a perfectly valid universal model of computation, and yet they have no notion of procedures or functions at all. But Turing machines are also deeply stateful. And so understanding them and intuiting what they're doing can be uh, really challenging and non-trivial. Instead, what we'd like is a model of computation that was a little bit closer to our textual reduction semantics that we've been developing so far. We'd like to think in that kind of setting, what would procedural abstraction look like and what facilities would you use to help perform it? That's what we're going to start looking into today because most functional programming languages support what are called anonymous or first class functions, sometimes called lambdas. Now we call Racket a functional programming language, and this is because in Racket, functions are first class values. And this means that Racket has some native understanding of what a function is. You can bind functions to variables. You can return functions as the result of other functions, and you can accept functions as arguments. Now languages that support functions being first class values we call those functional languages, and a surprising number of today's currently existing programming languages are functional programming languages. So for example, JavaScript, Ruby, Python, a lot of modern languages actually support functions as first class values through facilities that we'll talk about as we go through the class. All right, so let's work through a few examples with these. First, we've got this function f up here, which is lambda x, x. And then we've got this function double of g, which is lambda x. And then it's going to take g, and it's going to basically do it twice. So this function double is going to take some function f, and it's going to return a function that wraps f and performs f twice in a row. So for example, if I do double f, that result is a function that's going to first call the identity function, and then on the result of that, call that again. All right, so then let's see what happens. Let's start off with an easy one here. We'll take this code and we'll copy and paste it over into Dr. Racket. All right, so start over here. All right, so now we're in Dr. Racket. I'll paste over the starter code. I've got F and I've got double G. And now let's see what's gonna happen. So first, what happens when I do F applied to one? Well, that's just lambda X, X applied to one. This is just the identity function. So you replace the argument inside the body. And so we just get back one. All right, now what about double F of 42? Let's see what happens here. Double F, 42. Well, this is going to be lambda X, F, F of X. All of that applied to 42. All right, so what's that? Well, we've got this lambda right here. 
So we can take this 42 and plug it in and we get F, F, 42. And now the just F is just the, I, uh, just the identity function. So that reduces to F of 42. And then again, we just get 42. So here's what our reduction sequence looks like for this example. All right, what about this last example here? This is a kind of a trickier one. Instead of having a function called with double, I have another lambda. All right, so let's see what's going to happen there. Well, I'm just going to take this and I'm going to put it in and I'm going to substitute the definition. And then again, right here. And all of that's going to be called on two. All right, so I can get rid of this first lambda by applying it. All right, so I see here I've got a lambda. Now I understand it's really complicated looking, but think about this. Anytime that you've got a lambda, you've got a function. If you've got a function and you've got a value you can apply it to, what's the one way you can perform your computation? Well, you plug it in. All right, so how do we perform this computation? Well, it's just as simple as taking this body right here and substituting the values that appear for x. Now I've done something a little bit kind of naive here. I've made my code hard to understand because this, this name X is kind of being used in a few different places. So let's maybe kind of, let's rename this. We're gonna name this Y. It doesn't actually change the value at all in this, uh, in this circumstance, but it'll make it easier to understand. All right, so we're gonna take this right here. I'm gonna do our computation on that. Uh, this is gonna be our body. So we're gonna plug it in. Take that right there and we'll substitute for Y the value two. All right, so now I've got this function being applied to this function. All right, so how do I do that? Well, it's kind of scary because both sides are lambdas now, so it's a little bit more complicated than it was before, but it's not too much harder. What I do is I take this and I put this into the definition. All right, so here's what I get out. I get times this whole lambda here applied to two and then two. So I can't multiply this by two yet because this would need to be a value. And notice, this is a call site right here. This right here is a function we're calling and applying it to two. So this entire form right here, this subform is a call site. We can perform that reduction right there. We'll substitute this in, substitute this body, and we'll get times two, two. And now that gives us four times two and that gives us eight. So the answer to this last one over here is, uh, is eight. All right, now that last one was definitely a lot trickier. I think that's probably one of the trickiest things we've seen in class so far. So if you didn't understand that one, try to rewind and go through it a few times. See if you can work through in your head what was going on. And if you got stuck on it, please raise issue in class and we can talk about it.
All right, so our next exercise is going to tell us to write a function foo f that accepts another function f. We're assuming that this function f maps integers to integers. And the behavior that we want is that foo f applied to some x is going to be equal to f of the absolute value of x. All right, so how do we code this up? So let's go into Dr. Racket. So we need to write a function foo x such that, or uh, no, sorry, foo f such that foo f applied to x eventually reduces to f applied to absolute value of x. All right, so first we need to write our absolute value function. So let's do that again. We'll say if x is less than 0, we're going to return negative x. Otherwise, we're going to return x. All right, so let's test it out and see, does this one work? Oops, I'll let that out for now. All right, and now do absolute value of negative two. All right, that one works. Absolute value of two. All right, that one works. So now we're gonna define our function foo of f. So how are we gonna do this? Well, we know that we need to return another function. So we're gonna return a lambda. And we know that this function f, we know that it accepts one argument. It accepts an integer, and it's gonna return to us an integer back. So we know that our lambda needs to look like lambda x, not lambda x, y, z, needs to look like lambda x because f is only gonna have one argument. And so we're gonna kind of wrap f in this call to foo. So we've got a lambda f, uh, we got a lambda x right here. And then how are we gonna actually implement the body? We're gonna do f of absolute value of x. All right, uh, oops. Let's find the previous definition and comment it out. All right. Okay, so now I've got foo of, let's say, something like lambda x, x. So let's do lambda x, x applied to negative two. All right, so what would it mean if we had the right behavior and we called foo of lambda x, x, what's gonna happen if we call this on negative two? Well, what should happen? Well, foo of f is going to sort of just be like this call to lambda x, x here, except whenever x is negative, we're gonna replace it with the absolute value. So the result that we're gonna get back is going to be two because foo is going to make it so that instead of calling this function on x, we're gonna call it on the absolute value of x. All right, all right. So let's dig back into the slides. Now I've been doing it so far a few times just in Dr. Racket, but it's worth pointing out. We should think about what does a model for textual reduction look like? So in our last few lectures, I've been sort of informally building out a model of what I'm calling textual reduction for a core part of Racket, core scheme. We're not explaining how all of it works yet, but it would be nice whenever we explain new language features if we could also explain how textual reduction for those features works. And so previously, when we explained how definitions and recursive definitions worked, we said that the environment held the definition of functions. We could apply those functions by plugging into their definitions and substituting into the body. That was the substitution model we read about in SICP and we presented in the video. Now for lambdas, it's actually even simpler. All you have to do is just plug the values from the arguments into the body. 
So instead, we can sort of now think of lambdas as being the primitive thing. Previously, we had definitions of being the previous, uh, the sort of the primitive thing. So you're kind of used to seeing stuff in Racket that looks like looks like this. Used to defining a function like define f of x as body x. Now it turns out that once I have lambdas, I don't need the define keyword at all, or I don't need this special syntax, at least for defining functions. As long as I can just define variables, and even if I had, let's say, just like let, for example, I could always do something like let f be lambda x x within this body right here. So anytime that I have a define using the special syntax to define a function, I could always replace that by just defining a lambda. And this is pretty much going to be true. There are going to be a few cases we're going to run into some issues that relate to free and closed variables. And we'll see what's going to happen with that. That's going to motivate our discussion of closures in the next few weeks. All right, so looking back at the slides here, we just see that any time that I could write a define form where I'm a defining a function f of x, I could always equivalently instead use just a lambda. And so I can really think of lambda as being kind of the primitive thing the language handles. Now, how do I formally state the rule for textually reducing lambdas? I'm gonna state it here once and you can refer back to it whenever you're thinking about how textual reduction works. The rule is pretty simple. In a call by value language like Racket, we're going to say that after reducing all of the arguments to values, to perform textual reduction for a lambda, you substitute into the body the actual arguments, so the runtime arguments, the values, in place of the formal arguments. All right, so let's see how a reduction works for textual reduction of lambdas in this example right here. I'll just take this and start with it. We'll copy this over into Dr. Racket. All right, so we've got this lambda x, y, x. We've got this argument right here and this other argument right here. Now this is a two argument lambda and its body just drops the second argument and just returns x. Now, how do we reduce this? In a call by value language, and this is very important to remember because there are other languages that don't do this. In particular, in call by name or in lazy languages, they actually wait until the values are used to perform reduction. That's not what we're going to do in Racket. In Racket, we're going to follow what's called applicative order, where we always perform the leftmost innermost reduction. And because of that, what we're going to do is we're going to wait until all of these things are values to perform the application. What I mean by that is that we can't just simply say, all right, well, I could step to, so it would be wrong to do plus one, one, applying this and plugging it in for X right here. Because if I had done that, I wouldn't have first reduced plus one, one to a value. Instead, what I'm gonna do is say, this transforms to lambda x, y, x, two, three. All right, so that's the first step. And then the second step is actually plugging it in. So in that case, I get two. All right. All right. So now I want us to carry out this larger exercise. Let's use textual redu reduction to reduce the following expression down to a value. All right, it's a pretty big one. So this is really gonna test our abilities. And look at this big hint here. It says, remember, in applicative order, we always evaluate the leftmost innermost application. Or in other words, if we have some call site, E0, E1, and others, First, we reduce E0, the function argument, to an actual lambda or a function we can call. And then we reduce all of the arguments to values. And then we perform the application. 
Now, if this definition seems too complicated to remember, eventually you'll understand what it means by just repeating it so often in this class. But you can think of it intuitively as just sort of evaluating things in left to right order. All right, so let's look back at Dr. Racket and see how is this going to work. All right, so I've got this. Got this expression right here. So I need to evaluate things from left to right. First, this is a function, but it's not a lambda yet. See, it's a lambda applied to another lambda. So I first have to reduce this to a value. Then I have to reduce this to a value. And then I have to actually perform the application. All right, so let's try to make some progress on this. Well, this is a call site. But neither of these are lambdas yet either. So I can't actually perform this reduction. So then I'm going to go down to a third level and I'm going to say, all right, well, right here, I can reduce this and transform this into taking this and stuffing it into this lambda right here. So let's in fact rename this. We're going to rename this y, y. We'll rename one this one z, z. And let's re just rename this one a, a, so we don't get confused. It's right, so the first step. I'm going to do uh, this application here. So this is just the identity function. So I'm going to get rid of this. And then I have to get rid of the quotes around it because I actually called it. All right, so that's the first step. All right, what about the second step? All right, well then now here I need to reduce this argument to a value. All right, so let's do that now. Well, this is the identity function applied to the identity function. So I'm going to replace the argument for the body. And that's just going to result in lambda zz. All right, so now this is looking a lot more like something I'm used to. All right, so I have the same thing here. I can't call this as a function yet because it's still not really a lambda. This is still a call form, right? It's an application of this lambda to this lambda. So let's perform that invocation. That's just going to give us back lambda zz. So we're going to take this. We're going to get lambda zz back. All right. And now this is just the identity function applied to 1 plus 2. So this is a lambda. We don't need to do anything else to operate on this. But then we have to reduce this argument to a value. All right, so let's do that. This becomes 3. We reduce it further. Now we can actually perform this application because all of our arguments are values. And so then we just get 3. All right. Now it's worth spending a few moments talking about some languages that don't have first class functions. In modern times, it can actually be hard to imagine these languages because you probably mostly program in languages that have first class functions. Um, even if you have languages like object oriented languages like Java or C sharp, you have usually some notion of objects. So you get something a lot closer to the, what you would have than in a language like C, for example. Now, C is a really good example of a language that is procedural but not functional. C call sites are quasi-functional in the sense that they allow you to return or accept function pointers, but not really. C doesn't have full closures. That's what we'll talk about in a while. But I will show an example of how you can kind of mock this in C. So here is the uh, C library quicksort function. It accepts a pointer to an array. You don't really need to know how that works if you don't know C, but it also accepts the number of items in the array to sort, the size of each item, and then it accepts 
a function, a pointer to a function that accepts two arguments. So if you don't know how pointers work, it doesn't really matter, but it just means it gives you a reference to some function that this qsort function is then going to call to then compare each of the pairs of elements in this array to then perform the sort. All right. So that's a good example of how in C we can kind of mock functions, but we'll see why as we go throughout the class, they don't give us quite the exact behavior we might want.